Okay, okay. it's going. Hello. This is, this is number three, everyone. It has been one of those days. Okay. I don't even know what's so going on. So I'm right David now. Butler. I'm Emily Freeman. This is Don't Miss This. You should say the week. And it's, oh, Matt, the, Matt, well, I'll say it when we get to it, but it's Matthew 18, Luke 10, when we get to it. Um, but we wanted to start by doing a quick intro because we're getting a lot of emails and questions about who we are, how we know each other, and, and all those types of things. So first off, no, we're not married. We're just really good friends. We are married, but just to other people. Oh, yeah, we are married <laughs> to different people. So I am married to Jenny, and we have six kids. They go from age 14 down to four, so we're just in the, in the thick of that. Um, I teach institute at UVU. You can follow our adventures on Instagram. Come meet all my kids and Jenny on Instagram. I'm Mr. Dave Butler on Instagram. And you are Emily. And I am married to Greg. And we have five kids. My kids are all older. We're in the next stage of life. So I've got three boys. They're all married. And we've got grandkids, three grandkids, which I love having grandkids. And then I've got two girls, one on a mission, and um, Meg teaching special ed. And we just have this fun, crazy life. We live at um, football games and travel to see the grandkids, and that is what life looks like every single day. Um, so that is the fun of that. You can follow me and all of my family on Emily Bell Freeman at Instagram. Make sure you put the E. It's Bell like Beauty and the Beast. Yeah. That will help you find us Website, everywhere. Website, email, all those things. Yep, yeah. You just want to remember Bell is B-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. Um, it's fun to just quickly say how we met. Okay. Brother Butler was my son Josh's seminary teacher, which was so fun. And many, many years ago, I thought it was going to be awesome to walk from the Draper Temple to the Salt Lake Temple because I love... John Moyle. Yeah, and I had the same idea at the same time before we knew each other. And Josh knew both of us wanted to do that, so he was like, you should go together. I imagined a seminary teacher walking in a suit 24 miles to the temple. And she thought I was 70 years old. I did. I couldn't help it. I don't know why seminary teachers in my mind wear suits all the time, and they're 65. Oh, we have to wear them too much. So then we decided to walk to the temple with 85 people. It was so fun. On Memorial Day one year. Yeah. And that is how we got to know each other. And now we teach all the time together. We write books together. Yeah. So that is how we know each other. Everybody, yeah. does that answer all your questions? Everything you wanted to know. And more, maybe. <laughs> and if you want more, Instagram. Yeah, perfect. Okay. okay, so back. We are Matthew 18 and Luke 10 today. And I, we might have to ta have this lesson go for seven hours because we love this chapter, <laughs> these chapters so much. So we're going to do two parables and a true story. So two parables and one that actually happened. Um, and we're going to start in Matthew 18. And we're going to start with this parable. I named it the king and the two servants. I, I don't know what it's called. Um, but this is something that we want to do when we get, can I name them? I don't know if I'm allowed to, but I named it. Um, so we're starting in verse 21 of Matthew 18. And I'm starting here because whenever you get to a parable, what you want to do is you want to find out what was the situation or what was the question that spurred the parable on in the first place. So in this one, um, Peter comes to the Lord in verse um, 21 and says, Lord, how oft shall I forgive? I mean, oh, I can't even read. How oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times. Now, what Peter's doing is he knows Jesus is merciful. So like kind of Jewish custom at the time was you forgave people three times. You know, kind of a three strikes you out sort of policy. And he knew Jesus would go beyond that. So he's kind of like, um, how often should we forgive people? Like seven? You know, so he's doubling at plus one because he knows Jesus. Um, and Jesus answers in 22 and says, um, no, not seven times, but 70 times seven. So it's funny because Peter was sort of exaggerating when he said seven. You know, thinking like, there is no way. So he's just like, how many times should we forgive? A million, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Um, and Jesus comes back and he says, no, Google. I said a number, I don't know, you know. No, that is not a number, infinity. You seven, had to yeah, say infinity. Yeah, 70 times 7. And which is also, in, we have to talk about the symbolism. Oh, yeah. In this. Two kinds of symbolism, actually. Okay, you go first because maybe there's not two kinds. Maybe we're thinking of the same okay. one. <laughs> so I love anytime you read the number 7, you just automatically in my head, if I ever see it, I know it means complete. And whole. Um, yep, wholly and completely. And so 
You could read that as if Jesus was saying, like when I look at someone who has offended me, am I really going to keep track on my kitchen fridge how many times? One, two, 489, three. 489, yeah. no. 490. Uh, in essence, what he was saying to Peter is completely. Yeah. And then, okay, keep going. Yeah. Ho- just holy. Yeah. You, you've got to um, all the way right. forgive. And I love also the idea of, I think he's also teaching with that number seven, whole and complete. He's like, that is the path to wholeness is to forgive others. Um, not for tally marks, not for keeping track, but really I'm teaching you how to become whole, mm-hmm. how to become healed is by forgiving others. So that's the conversation that's going on when Jesus gives this parable. And you'll see on the study guide sheet, um, I, I kind of just took a couple just to give you an example of as you go through a parable, you remember you want to look at what was the custom of the time and what do each of those things uh, represent? And this one, Jesus doesn't give us much of an explanation like he did in the parable of the, so of the soul. <laughs> um, and, so, um, and so you kind of have to think through this. And he starts by telling you the kingdom of heaven is like this. So let me teach you what um, life in, in my kingdom one day looks like. And you might want to draw it like we did before. And you're gonna, you want to look for all the details first. Then you want to think about how would the first people have heard it? What would they have known? Right, and understood. And then you want to look at the lesson. Right. So you might remember this is a parable of a, a certain king who took account of his servants. Um, and one came in, in verse 24, which owed him 10,000 talents. Now this is a number, uh, Bible scholars debate a little bit on how much this actually is. It's tough to convert money. But we are talking an astronomical number here. Like at least a lifetime's worth of wages. A billion dollars at least in in our money. And you have to remember, this is a servant who's on a servant's wage. And so this is a number that is chosen on purpose by Jesus to say, this is a debt and a number that that would take, I did the math one time, like 121 lifetimes for him to ever pay back. Yeah, for it's, sure it's his whole life. It's impossible. His, yeah, whole, life his whole life and beyond. Yeah. Like not there's not even a prayer. It's such a huge number, which makes what he says so interesting. Um, well, 25 it says, because he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold into slavery and his wife and his children, all that he had and payment to be made, which means he would have lost everything. Right? And in those times that's what you did. You went into hired servitude and your wife and children would also. Mm-hmm. Um, if if you couldn't pay back a debt. And he falls down in verse 26. And I love that part, that he falls Mm -hmm. down before him and worshiped him saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. Which anybody watching that scene would have snickered and said, everybody knows you can't do it. Not in his lifetime. Right, there's no way that he can do that. Um, And then 27, and this should give you a hint about who maybe this represents. The Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt immediately. Just and, and you want to look at wait, what did the man have to do to be forgiven of that debt? Fall down and ask, and then he was forgiven of mm-hmm. the debt. So then that same man goes out and found um, another one of his servants. So that servant had a servant who owed him a hundred pence, which is no small amount. It would have been like two months worth of wages is what 100 pence is. So, I mean, that's like significant. Yeah. Nothing compared to 10,000 yeah. talents. But still, and, and he took him by the throat, you know. That's like, that's creepy, mm-hmm. verse 28. And says, pay me what thou owest. And he fell down at his feet and, and begged him, saying, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. And you love that it's the exact same thing. Right. right? It's the same request, exactly. Except he could have. This servant actually could have. Over time. Yeah, if he'd, if he'd had some patience with him. Um, anyways, he, uh, he, threw him into, he threw him into jail and he said, no, um, I'm going to sell you into servitude and, and, and all those people. Now the Lord, the king, had figured out um, what had happened and then brought him back in. And he says to him, I forgave thee, this verse 32, all that debt because you desired it, because you asked, should you not have also had compassion on your fellow servant? even as I had pity on you, right? So what, what a great um, parable, a beautiful parable. Remember the context and the question was, how often do we forgive mm-hmm. people? And the answer is, let me tell you about this parable, about two people in uh, different amounts um, that, that they owed. 
Um, so as you look at this, a, a certain king um, is most likely the Lord, right? And the 10,000 talents, that is the amount that he forgives of us. This is a debt that none of us could ever, the debt of sin, the debt of death and the fall is something that in a thousand lifetimes we could never we could never repay. And I love that because in essence, what, what the servant was saying in the parable is, um, look, give me a chance to do it, right? And it was his whole life right. it would take. And when Jesus says, no, I'll do it. And it was his whole life. Yeah. Oh, yes. It, really, he was That's like, so beautiful. I-, I will give everything. I will give my whole life to forgive your debt. And what's so interesting is something I think that's really important to look at in this parable is in those times, a king didn't even have that amount of money. Um, and so for him to forgive that debt most likely meant that that king would have to go bankrupt in order to forgive the debt. Um, and, and that's such a beautiful lesson that our, our king went bankrupt. He gave, yeah, he gave, he gave everything. everything. He lost everything. Right. In, in order, order to for forgive us. our debt you know, to have that all. And you might see at the end that he turns them over, you know, to, you know, to jail. The tormentors is, is into jail. And so that he would have to pay and earn, you know, earn that back and everything. Um, and you kind of are like, whoa, that's a little bit crazy. I don't think the Lord is saying, like, I won't forgive you unless you forgive other people. But rather, you can see this and there's evidence that he didn't actually receive that forgiveness. Mm-hmm. Like, he didn't actually receive that the grace. grace. If he had really received it, there's no way he would have gone choking somebody else. Right, because when we have received grace and we understand that in our life, what happens is we reciprocate grace. If we understand what we've received, then um, we reciprocate that. And we talked about a, a poem earlier that is one of my favorite bo- oh, yeah, poems. Let me get it. um, it's called Forgiveness Flower, and it just teaches this lesson so beautifully. And I think you ought to explain like what the culture yeah. of the flowers so the before culture, you read it. Yep, the culture of this town where this story is written about is kind of a funny culture. Um, what happens is if you offend someone, then how you get forgiven is you go to their house and you ask for flour. So if I had offended David, then I would go to his house, I'd knock on the door, and I would say, um, can I get flour from you? And then David, according to how much he's going to forgive me, it's That's how much, so much flour, flour I'm going to give. He's going to give me. And that so you is kind what, of measure it out, depending on how big the offense was, that so yeah. much flour, whatever. And, and you your, know? your forgiveness is three strikes and you're out. It's what it almost feels like. And yet we want you to be remembering what did the Lord teach 70 times 7, complete, whole. And this story teaches it so beautifully. So um, this is by Marguerite Stewart. It's called Forgiveness Flower. She says this, When I went to the door at the whisper of knocking, I saw Simeon Gartner's daughter, Kathleen, standing there in her shawl and her shame, sent to ask forgiveness flower for her bread. Forgiveness flower, we call it in our corner. If one has erred, one is sent to ask for flower of his neighbors. If they loan it to him, that means he can stay. But if they refuse, that means he has to take himself off. I looked at Kathleen, what a jewel of a daughter, though not much like her father, more's the pity. I'll give you flour, I said, and went to measure it. Measuring was the rub. If I gave too much, neighbors would think I made sin easy. But if I gave too little, they would label me close. While I stood measuring, Joel, my husband, came in from the mill, a great bag of flour on his shoulder, and seeing her there, shrinking in the doorway, he tossed the bag at her feet. Here, take all of it. And so she had flour for many loaves while I stood measuring. I just love in that moment, that husband shows us this is, this is what it is to forgive 70 times 7, right? Take the whole bag. He doesn't even think about it. You want my forgiveness? You have all of it. You have everything. Yeah, which makes me think like if we could like go back in time or, you know, like <laughs> it's a fictional like story, right? Like, if you wrote another chapter in it, you would find a time, I think, when that father would have been forgiven. And that's why he he's knew. able to give so freely. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. So good. Right. Okay. The next one we're going to go to is the, the second Samaritan. best parable in all the Bible. <laughs> and it's the Good Samaritan. And now everyone wants to know what the first best is. It's easy, the prodigal son. Like, I don't know why anyone's fighting about that. <laughs> um, okay. This is in Luke chapter 10. 
Um, so come to this part. Again, we're going to start with this question. So go all the way down into the 20s um, where you get into verse 25. And there's kind of two questions with this. The first one is a lawyer comes who would have known the law really well and says, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said, well, what's written in the law? And the answer back is to love God with all your heart and to love your neighbor as thyself. Um, and then Jesus says back, verse 28, you answered right, do this and live. That's the answer to eternal life. Um, but he, willing to justify himself, kind of pushing a little bit, asks the second question, which is, well, who is my neighbor? Oh, so it's that a good question is, too. It's a good question for even our day. Right, right. Who, um, who should with I the, love? Right, who do I love? Who do I love? Um, and so that is what spurs this parable on. So Jesus tells this parable. And I don't, do we start by just reading it or do we... Um, teach as we go. Everyone okay. knows it. Let's okay, you know it, we so we'll just move yeah. through as we go. Remember, everybody in the story is, everything happening in that story, he's trying to teach something. And we should say this. You can read this parable so many different ways. Um, and you should, right? You should study it as if you are the Samaritan one time. You should study it as if you are the man who was stripped and beaten. You should study it as if you are the, the priest, innkeeper, the, the Levite, yeah, the anybody. innkeeper. Because you're going to learn something different every time. Don't study it as the thieves that beat him up. <laughs> okay, don't do that. Um, but we are going to do something different. So you should introduce how we've chosen okay. to study it today. So there are a lot of early Christian writers who read this parable and, and interpreted it as a story about... Um, our mortal journey. So you're going to notice at the very beginning that the man comes down from Jerusalem um, down into Jericho. A certain man, almost like it could be anybody. This could be your story. And I love when you explain, it's almost as if this parable is teaching the plan of salvation. That's what you right. want to be watching. So J Jerusalem is to 2,500 feet above sea level. And Jericho's right at sea level. So literally in the story, it's a story about a man who comes from a, a, a home above down um, to a home below is what is happening. So he says, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And sometimes do you ever feel like that is how life is? I mean, that is a, a great description of some of your days on earth, right? Yeah. You're just left wounded. You're left beaten. Um, you're exhausted, right? You're hurt. You're wounded. Or half dead. You know, just mm -hmm. that, that whole... And, and, and I read this a couple of different ways sometimes. Like, who are the thieves? And sometimes it, it's my own sin, um, my own pride that's robbed me of these things. And sometimes there will be so many people who will fall among thieves um, by no fault of their own. Mm -hmm. And they'll be wounded and they'll be hurt um, because of nothing that they've done wrong. And they'll be left um, there on, on the roadside. And then he says, and by chance, so accidentally, now I'm, I'm pointing that out because of the difference between this one and then what happens with mm -hmm. the Samaritan. So notice by chance, there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And let's talk about why he might have done that. So he's a priest. Do you want to teach us about a priest? Yeah, a priest and a Levite, the one who comes next. Um, particularly the Levite here, when he comes and passes by on the other side, he's a temple worker. Um, and if you come in contact with a dead body or blood, then you have to go through a ritual cleansing before you're allowed to participate in the temple ordinances again. So it would have been a great reason to say, I can't, I can't touch him, I can't be by him, I can't be near him, otherwise, you know. And it's interesting as you look, two, two words you might want to notice is the priest comes and when he saw him, it tells us, he passed by on the other side. When the Levite comes, he actually comes over and looks upon him, it tells us. Yeah. And then goes back, right, and passes by on the other side. And the other, yeah. And we'll talk about this. If this is a story about salvation, what we're seeing here is um, uh, two different ways that people would have understood that they could be saved. Remember that first question, mm -hmm. how do I obtain eternal life? Oh, it's through the priests. Or it's through the, um, you know, the, the sacrifices that are happening in the temple. And what we're learning here is neither of those two were capable of, of saving, saving this right? man. It, it's almost as if it's through the word or it's through the law. Right. Um, but those two things are what are going to save you. Yeah, if I study out the scriptures, if I know them really well, 
which is interesting because that's the person who's asking him the question is yeah. somebody who knows the law really well. Yeah. And he's just like, that person can't save him. Um, the sacrifices in the temple aren't going to be able to save him. And then it says this, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. So not by chance, but came to that place. And let's just think about this for a minute because we can't resist. Think of your favorite story in the New Testament, any story. The woman at the well. The woman who touched Christ's robe. Bethesda, Peter in the, the water. Man in the man at Bethesda. Where was Jesus? Um, this is the message of Jesus' life. If you had to encapsulate it in one um, thing of how he serves people, this would be the message he came where he was. Yeah, and then the next line, which is, and had compassion on him. Those are the two things. He came and had compassion, mm -hmm. right? Um, a, 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 you know, what seems like a stranger. Now, you got to remember to everybody at the first century listening to this, the Samaritans were the hated people. Um, they were a mix between um, outsiders and um, the Jews that were taken away they into captivity. They were despised by men. Yeah. Um, they were outcast. Right. And they were half. They were like half Jewish and half um, uh, Samar uh, from Samaria. Mm -hmm. Right. They just, they, they were not. Um, so the fact that he's the one who comes and has compassion is interesting. And it's interesting that Jesus is somebody who was not well liked. Yeah. During his and, time. And interesting that the two didn't want to touch the man who was down. And a Samaritan would be someone considered untouchable, right? Unclean. And so it's interesting that that is going to be the one, the one they don't regard as someone with any merit or um, ability to heal is the one right. who's going to who's come. Who's going to actually do it. Then this verse that's right here, uh, starting in verse 34, we've got a spot on the study guide sheet where we just leave a spot where it's like, what are some of the words that describe what the Samaritan did from here all the way through? I hope you can see by now that the Samaritan represents um, Jesus. And so these are actually some of my favorite verses on, on, on his atonement, on who he is and how he heals uh, it's just described in this parable form. And it says this, And he went to him, and he bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and what sort of thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Um, so let's just think about some of those words. Yeah, and we have to, right off the bat, when you think of the first ones, went to him, bound up, poured in oil, um, took care of him, brought him to the inn. Um, immediately, both of our minds went to Isaiah 61, yeah. 1 through 3. Um, it's just a beautiful description of the Savior and his atonement, and maybe you want to read yeah. those for us. And, and before I read it, I think it's, remember, um, oil was symbolic of, uh, it was, would have been olive oil. Mm -hmm. So you've got a foreshadow to Gethsemane here. Anointing. Anointing. Set apart. Um, wine is a symbol of the Savior's atonement also. And they're all healing. Right. right? Olive oil and wine would have had healing properties. Cleansing they would have and known healing. That. Mm -hmm. So this is Isaiah 61, 1 through 3. It says, this is um, a prophecy about Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And there's just so many similar words in there, right? The binding up, the oil of joy for heaviness, um, the comforting, um, the healing that comes. Sometimes we forget that um, the atonement that came through Jesus Christ, the grace that comes, um, that word sozo, um, that we sometimes use as the word save or savior, is also can be um, translated as healing. And there's so much healing power that comes through the atonement of Jesus Christ. And we see it so beautifully encapsulated right here. Yeah. It's just like one of the most 
beautiful descriptions of what he does in this. And I've always loved this. Well, the, so the, some of those early Christian writers actually considered this host or this innkeeper um, to be the, the church. Hmm. Um, that he comes and says, please take care of him while I'm gone. And when I come again, a second time, I will repay thee. And again, we think about that first parable and what was the cost? What, what's the cost that he is going to pay that debt? with and again it's his whole life right, right? it's everything yeah because you get that with like he sets him on his own beast like almost like he's the one who carries him and one you know, of the other like things that we love that we talked about earlier um is that how long did he take care of him oh. this man and it tells us he, he carried him to the inn on his own beast and then he cared for him and the very next sentence that comes is on the morrow when he departed and we realize he sat with him all through the night. He was there for the whole first night. And I love that he did not leave in the darkest hour, but he sat with him and he watched over him and he cared for him. And just as you think about those two phrases about the Good Samaritan, first he came where he was, and then in verse 35, and he um, asked that he would take care of him the way he had been caring for him. And as the church, do we do that? Yeah. How well do we do that? We were talking earlier that um, the very first question that mankind asked God in the scriptures in the book of Genesis is actually from Cain, who asked that question, am I my brother's keeper? And uh, I just feel like the rest of the Bible answers that question. Yes. Mm -hmm. And Jesus shows us what that looks like and what what that means to to take care. I love that from Jesus. Mm -hmm. I almost hear him like asking us, like, please take care of each other. Mm -hmm. Look out for each other. You know, And it begs the question, when you read it, for each of us to say, who do you know right now who is bruised? Who do you know who is wounded? Who do you know um, that's been beaten and that is in that place where they are just um, laying on the side of the road? Who is that person for you? And, um, and what's our response? Do we see them and we're like, oh... That's sad, right? Do we look on them? Like we're like, oh, I, I'm going to read everything about what is happening in your life. That's hard. Or do we meet that person where they are? Do we meet them in that wounded place where they're bruised and where they're beaten? Are we willing to go into those hard and painful areas and sit with someone through the darkest parts? Um, because that's, that's going to be the invitation, right? right. That's going to become the invitation in 37. Um, well, 36, maybe you, you want to read 36 and 37. Right. So it ends and he says, now, which of these three was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves, you know, asks him. And then the man who asked the question says, well, he that showed mercy on him, um, which he just gives, that's a definition of Mm. who's a neighbor. It's like one who shows mercy. And I love what Dallin H. Oaks teaches us about mercy, that it's a blessing that was undeserved. Yeah. Um, it's just, it, it's that blessing that just comes in that moment. And then the invitation, the call to all of yeah, us. Yeah, and 37 is go and do thou likewise. In your own way, in, in, in your own situations, mm-hmm. like, because there's going to be so varied and there are going to be so many, which is so awesome about a parable. As you and I read this, you and I will see different people in our mind, like laying on the roadside. Because that's what parables can do, is they, they speak to us in all of our different situations mm-hmm. and and everything. Okay, now we're going to end, and it comes right after with this true story. This is a real story of uh, Mary and Martha. It's only a couple verses long. Don't and... worry, we argued about it for forty-five <laughs> minutes already. We seriously, we were we were fighting everybody about this story. So now we're going to teach you Alfred Ader's honey view on this story because we could not come to an agreement on this. Well, I think we did. I think we came to a really, really good agreement. Okay. At the end. We'll talk um, about what it is. Yeah, and we're going to talk about what it is. Um, but um, this is the story of Mary and Martha, and Martha is serving, and Mary's going to sit at the Savior's feet, and we have it memorized. And if you are a woman, you've talked about it 10,000 times in Release Society. And, and if we, you're a man, you don't even know where it is. Yeah, and when he started trying to tell me what he had learned from the parable, I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. we got to think about all these people in greater detail. And then, um, and it's hard. We all have an opinion on this story. We do. Everybody who's listening, you have an opinion about Martha, and you have an opinion about 
Mary and so we had to leave a blank box on the study guide sheet. Like, yep, what are you, you learn learning? Your own lesson. Yeah, what are you, you learning learn from this story? Lesson. And um, some things we should point out is it's interesting. Whose house is it? It's Martha's house. And she's the oldest sister. Um, people feel like she probably had wealth. She had means. Um, and on this day, what we do know that we agree on is Jesus came not by himself. Um, it tells us when we read, now it came to pass as they went, he entered into a certain village. And so there was a crowd with him, probably the disciples, right. everyone he travels with. They're going to come to the home. Um, those of you who are moms or women who have cooked or ever had a party for more than 10 people, you know what that cooking is going to look like. And we have that moment where Martha is is working and is serving and um, Mary comes and sits at the feet of the Lord and then the question becomes who was right or who was wrong and what's the good part and what is the lesson and you've heard a million different people teach it a million different ways and that's what we talked yeah. about for 45 minutes but then the conclusion is it's really powerful I think yeah, I think it is too and um, so we're gonna lean on two Bible scholars right James Talmadge Okay. And I'm going to be um, in Alfred Adersheim. We've talked about both of them before. We love them. And I just think the lesson they teach is so wise. And and we're not going to end with who was right or wrong. That isn't what's going to happen. But we are going to end with a lesson that is so powerful um, to, to think about. Okay. So you start us off. Uh, the one thing that we know is that Jesus is not upset with either of them. Right, that he shows love to both of them. And what you see is both of them are showing their own love and devotion back to him in their own way, in the way that they know best to show love and devotion. So uh, James Talmadge actually says that Martha shows it with her um, hospitable nature, her nature to serve and to be self-denying. And Mary then shows it by being contemplative and through her companionship and appreciation. But they both had different ways of showing love, and they both equally show those ways. I mean, show love and appreciation to the Lord. In different ways. In different ways. Um, and I love when Alfred Adersheim starts teaching it, and he says, how best to do him honor was equally the thought of both. And um, to Martha, it seemed as if she could not do enough in showing him all hospitality. That's what she wanted to do was just serve him and serve him well. Her younger sister also would do him all highest honor, but not the way Martha did. Her homage consisted in forgetting all else but him who spake as none had ever done. And then we talk about that moment when Mary comes and sits and Martha is, is making the dinner and preparing the home and getting ready to take care of all these gifts, guests. And I love what Alfred says. He says, and so time after time, perhaps hour after hour, as Martha passed on her busy way, she still sat listening and living. And I love that Alfred is like, Martha, she knew who Jesus was. She knew the importance of what he was teaching. And she was probably listening as she worked. And, and the problem wasn't whether they were serving or whether they were listening. The problem comes, we all know, when Martha is like, um, should you tell my sister to come and help me right now? And Jesus says to her, and I love what Alfred teaches us about this, because we look at it and we're like, was she rebuked in that moment? Was she given counsel in that moment? And I love that Alfred tells us, you see the affection of the Lord for Martha, because he says to her, Martha, Martha, that repeating of her name. Twice. Which culturally back then was a sign of compassion and tenderness. When you said someone's, so whenever you see that in scripture, a name twice, you can read into the tone of what was happening. And we do see it, right? We see it again with Simon. Simon, Simon. Right. Um, that you see that over and over. And so it, it helps us. That gives us a clue into this conversation that he's responding to her with affection in this moment. Martha, Martha, you are careful and troubled about many things. And we know exactly what happens next because it says, And Mary hath chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. And um, and that is where the argument starts, right? We all want to know what was he talking about in that moment. And I love... Um, because here's the thing. Here, the thing was, is a person uh, could avoid serving by sitting at the feet of Jesus, or a person could avoid sitting at the feet of Jesus by serving. So we just don't know what was yeah. going on inside their hearts. You can look at it so many different ways, and we do. We all do. And I love what Alfred says because he says, um, he says this. He taught her in words which, however simple in their primary meaning, are so full that they have ever since borne many-sided applications. 
And he talks about how we all look at them and we try to read into them and we try and figure out what they're saying and we try and figure out was someone at fault or should someone have done something differently than they did? And, and we don't know. And I love um, that Alfred says that. Um, whether what both Martha and Mary learned, either then or afterwards, um, we all try and search into. We all want to know who was the lesson for, what was the lesson, what was the outcome. And then this is the best line of the whole Mary and Martha story ever. He says this, suffice it, that though the natural disposition of the sisters remained what it had always been, yet henceforth, Jesus loved Martha and her sister. And that's the end of the lesson for me. We don't know. Easy. We don't know what happened, but we do know this, that, that it tells us in Scripture, Jesus loved Martha and Jesus loved Mary. And each of those women knew the lesson that Jesus was trying to teach them based on their own hearts, their own circumstances. What was own, happening that day. And what, yeah, whatever was going on. And I think we talked about earlier, and this is important. This is three verses in someone's whole life. Yeah. Sometimes we want to judge Mary and Martha off of three verses. We don't get to see what they did every day. And for me, I think if you want to have a really good understanding of Martha and Mary... You need to take these three verses and you need to combine them with John chapter 11. And it's what happens right after Lazarus dies. And rather than focusing on the story of Lazarus, um, I'm going to give you an invitation, a challenge, a little homework assignment. You just start reading in John 11, 19. And I want you to watch Martha's actions and Mary's actions in those next verses and I also want you to look at both of their testimonies and what you are going to find in John 11 is two remarkable women who loved the Lord and who showed their testimonies in different ways and and you just love both of them when all is said and done and I think that's what we need to remember yeah from that story and you know what I just remembered this story um because listen <laughs> listen Martha probably gets the short end of the stick more than Mary does. Like anytime people tell this story. And in the MTC, the new building, the MTC, they have all these really beautiful pictures that were done. They're just gigantic life-size pictures. Do you remember seeing, if you did the tour of it, you saw them. Yeah. And one of them is of Mary and Martha. And um, the paint, the picture was done to try and help missionaries like look at Mary, watch her sitting at the feet of Jesus, contemplating, teach them. That's a really important part of being a disciple. And the man... Um, who is the director of the MTC was telling us that he was giving a tour uh, to a group of people and there was a woman who stood at the painting, uh, the picture, just looking at it when the rest of the group went on. And he was kind of waiting to the side, waiting for her to come. And her husband um, walked over to her. Um, it was a family of one of the, of the Quorum of the Twelve. He walked over to her to get her and she was just looking at it and she says, you know what, sometimes I like being Martha so that other people get a chance to be Mary. Oh, that is so good. So we just don't, like we just, he loved them both. And when you combine that with everything that we've been looking mm -hmm. at, what's the good part? The good part is to choose Jesus because he's mercy, he's forgiveness, he's, he's tenderness, mm -hmm. like all those things. So, yeah. And just, just show our love, right? I love right. how both of them wanted to show their show love in different love. ways. And, and that kind of is the lesson, right? right? Even from the Good Samaritan, just love. Right. Just love people. That's what we have to do. So, right. okay. The end. The end. <laughs> that was a good one. And we'll see you next week.